Okay, um, we're in uh, Isaiah and um, uh, chapter 57 and verse 14. Um, the prophet's been told to, to tell the people, you know, about the coming deliverance. So he says, level up, level up and clear the way, remove the obstacle from my people's path. And the, the thing is, you know, we often read through one of these things and what you have is the idea of the removing of the obstacles to God coming. Yeah, that's what we have with the, the business of, you know, John the baptizer, make straight the way, lower the hills, fill the valleys. It's the idea for God coming. But this one has to do with the idea of the people, that there has to be a path cleared for the people to reach God. And when you, when you study in mystical theology, the, the idea is that, that God can always level a path to a person, but people choose to be in situations there are obstacles to the path of God. And then in those situations, it's very difficult for God to reach them. So anyway, this idea of, of clearing the people's paths. And notice that he, he's talking to like a third party. He says, remove the obstacles from the people's path. So that it's, it's a, I, I think it's a responsibility for us to be aware of of doing that. I think I've told you that I was part of the Azu Caritas group for a while. And one of the men was an alcoholic. And the day he joined, uh, we stopped having alcohol when we went out for meals. And no one said anything about it. And we did go to a restaurant that served alcohol. But I just noticed no one ordered alcohol. And that's the idea that you, you remove obstacles from people around you. He says, for thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever and whose name is holy. And remember the meaning of the word holy in Hebrew? Uh, kadosh, it means separate, different. And so this idea of uh, understanding that, that God is very different than we are. Like we talk of God as high or important, or so, but the fact of the matter is he doesn't fit in any of our categories. Like I think we would all agree that God is brighter than we are but you would never say God is brighter. He's just different. Everything about God is different from us. He says, I live in the holy heights, but I am with the contrite and with the humble of spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. So he's with humble people and with people who repent of their sins, but he's with them for a single thing and that's to revive their spirit to revive their heart so that you know you know that sometimes people who repent of a sin uh, think about it all the time that i i wish i hadn't done this or i wish i hadn't done that or the other thing but the idea is that repentance should bring peace and so same thing with humility uh, humility shouldn't give you a downtrodden sense humility should bring you peace okay and, and if these things are functioning right, I think I've told you the two dangers to humility are number one, putting myself down, in which case I force you to compliment me, or building myself up by complimenting myself. They're two sides of the problem. He says, for I shall not be judgmental forever, nor always be angry. For without me, the spirit is weak and I made everything that has breath. And this judgmental and angry, when you, when you look at children, that when a child is being raised, a parent disciplines a child and deals with a child very differently than they do as they get older. And you reach a point where uh, at the, the highest level, is that uh, a parent does not give any advice unless they're asked for it, but a child asks for it. That's the highest level. And the next lowest below that is where a parent gives advice without being asked. And that's usually at a time when the child would not normally ask anyway. So they're giving you advice. That, and then you know we go right down and at the very bottom of it is that the parent forces 
the action they want the child to do. There's no explanation or this sort of thing. Uh, stay out of the street, you know? The kid goes in the street, you pull him out of the street. It's just that simple. But with regards to God, in our lives it's that way too. And I think oftentimes, you know, you, you look at, um, let's say, the great deliverances that we would talk about in uh, the Bible with God with the battles of Joshua and stuff like that. And you look around and you say, well, why wouldn't he do that with the Ukraine today? Why doesn't he battle on the side of the Ukrainians? And the fact is that's not the way you operate with adults. And as a community, we've risen to a higher level. And so he tries to inspire us. Anyone who asks God for advice, he would tell them. But this, this idea of uh, asking him to intervene and force everything, that just doesn't, is not part of the way God acts anymore. He says, I was angry at their sinful greed. Your lips speak lies and your tongues utter wickedness. And notice again the basis of this. The basis of this is greed. He said, I was angry at the greed. And in, in the idea of fostering the greed, you lie and you utter uh, wickedness. It's the idea of tearing down someone's reputation. If I'm trying to sell you something and I don't want them to, I tear down the reputation. But this wickedness, it's all tied to greed. And I think it, it'd be interesting to, to study. I think there have always been, you know, greedy people in history. But I think that's a unique thing today where people are so totally focused on money. It is, it's just, it's, it, to me, it, it's remarkable. He says, relying on emptiness, they speak falsehood, contrive trouble, and give birth to evil. And this relying on emptiness, they speak falsehood. It isn't as though they know something's wrong with someone, and it isn't as though they're making it up. They speak about things that cannot be proven or denied. And in this emptiness, you can get away with your lie. And if you were to look at that in our own day, we'd talk about these, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what, are the, what are those things where they make something up that could be possible, but isn't the, uh, trying to think of it, like about the thing with the election, that it's all fraud. Conspiracy. Conspiracy. Conspiracy, conspiracy theories. That's what conspiracy theories are. If you listen to a conspiracy theory, the key to a good conspiracy theory is it cannot be proven, it's a theory, but it cannot be denied. You, you can't absolutely say that all the governments in the world aren't working together against all the people in the world. You can't honestly say that, but you can't prove they are working against the people either. You know, it's just, it, so they, they rely on this, uh, this emptiness so that they can, they can utter those things. And he says, no one makes just accusations or goes to law sincerely. And uh, again, uh, I think it's, a, it's an amazing thing to, way, to watch the way law works in our country. It's, um, you know, when, when we talk about the nobility of our country with regards to being a law-abiding state and everything, I think that's very true at the highest levels, but it isn't true at normal cases. And the, I, don't, I don't know how many here have ever been on a jury but I was on a jury once. It was a woman who was accused of arson. And uh, it, it was just amazing to me the, the way the discussion and stuff took place. And I learned one thing about it. If a judge ever tells you you aren't to discuss something in the jury room, that is the first thing that will be discussed once you get in there. Because he, you know, he has no control over you once you're in there. Uh, but the... Uh, when we got all finished and arrived at the fact uh, the woman was was guilty, but arrived at the fact that she was guilty and you know it was pretty well proven, there were three people who asked that we not give the decision right away so that we could have the court pay for lunch. I'm thinking someone's out there wondering whether they're going to jail and you want a cream puff. What what does you know? It's just, uh, I, 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 was, I was very put off by the whole system at that time. 
He says, uh, But I identify with them. Huh? I identify with those three. Who wanted the cream puff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't you volunteer for a jury when I'm accused of something. I want to go to jail right when I'm supposed to. <laughs> so he says, they are hatching adders' eggs and weaving a spider's web. Eat one of their eggs and you die. Crack one and a viper emerges. Uh, snakes lay eggs, uh, and uh, I'm presuming a viper is one that does here. But if you, uh, when the, the snake lays an egg, it isn't like a chicken's egg where the whole development takes place inside the egg. The development takes place inside the egg, inside the snake. So when the snake lays the eggs, that's a snake inside, not just a yolk and a uh, thing. So, so you, have, you have to be very, very careful of it. It's the idea that eat one of the eggs and you die, and crack one, a viper emerges. He says, what they weave is useless for clothing, and what they make is useless for wearing. And he talks about here weaving spider's webs. He says what, what they're weaving is in fact useless. And again, think of these uh, conspiracy theories. He says what, what they're putting together is, is worthless. You know, when I was uh, a youngster, I think the same people who um, put together conspiracy theories today used to write novels. And they were wonderful to read. They were wonderful things. But now they put it together as though it's actually happening. And it has a tr very different effect on society. So he says, um, their deeds are deeds of guilt. Their hands are full of the produce of violence. And that this idea their deeds are deeds of guilt, the, the temptation is to think that the someone who weaves the conspiracy, let's say someone who weaves the conspiracy that the Jews are in charge of everything and that you know, they put this out as the conspiracy and that sort of thing, they somehow feel immune when someone who listened to their conspiracy kills people. They, well, you know, I, that isn't what I wanted, this sort of thing. But this idea, they are, their deeds are deeds of guilt, that you and I are responsible for what we say. And if, uh, if I were to say something that would inspire someone else to commit a crime, I'm responsible to the degree what I said inspired the crime. I'm not necessarily responsible for the crime, but I have a responsibility to the degree what I said inspired the crime. And we, we watch, the, there's just a lot of things going on. I think about the replacement of the white race and stuff like this that are really strange things that go on in, in our society. I wish we had a politician in our society of the caliber of Nelson Mandela. That's what we need right now. Someone who can, who can look at that sort of thing and get them, get them away from it. He says, their hands are full of the products of violence. Their feet speed to do evil. They are quick to shed innocent blood. And the, he's getting at the, these people are in society and society needs to find a way to either silence or get rid of this kind of people because they're sowing seeds of dissension. And again, in their sowing the seeds, they feel independent of the results of what they have done. So that someone else actually shot the people, someone else did this, someone else did the other, but they don't understand the responsibility that rests on this, this thing. Their schemes are guilty schemes. Their highway is havoc and ruin. And this idea of the highway, of, of what you lead people down. And I, I would take, you know, to me, the best example of this in our society is actually the pro-life movement, where, you know, that it's interesting that the pro-life movement has oftentimes created a highway that someone went down and shot a doctor. That, you know, to be pro-life is one thing, but to promote it in such a way that I, I think it's also oftentimes very askew. They're in favor of the death penalty, but just, you know, 
It's, 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 a, it's a very curious thing. You know, when I was watching the uh, proceedings on the panel today, the, it was very interesting. The, uh, the guy from Arizona, I think it was, talked about um, how dedicated he was to the principles of the whole thing of the election. And he was a very, very strong Republican who voted for Trump. But he was very committed to the validity of the election itself. And, and, and this idea of not creating schemes, not creating habit, not creating ruin, but to be about what the society is supposed to be about, rather than, than twisting it. It's a, it's a very interesting thing. He says, they know not the way of peace and no fair judgment in their course. They have made their own pathways crooked and no one treading them knows peace. And again, the, the idea is what a person sows in society, what does it bring about? And again, to, to go back to Nelson Mandela, you know that that country when they overturned apartheid and eventually elected Nelson Mandela, I think it was in prison about a month before that. But anyway, when they elected him, that country was set up for vengeance. They were really set up to, and he, he worked them through that. And it's something no white person could have done. You could not possibly have done that. But one from the oppressed was able to do it. And Nelson Mandela did that. And, and to watch as the, is the path that I'm opening to people, is it ultimately a path of peace or not? Is this going to bring peace to our society? Is it going to bring peace to individuals? Ultimately, what will it done, do and really look at this idea of peace? He said, thus fair judgment is remote from us. Righteousness cannot catch up with us. And speaking of, you know, from the point of view of the individual, is that justice then becomes remote and righteousness cannot keep up because we have chosen to go down this very different path. And going down this different path, that is away from the idea of justice, it's away from the idea of peace. He says, we wait for light and everything is darkness, for brightness, and we walk in gloom. And I'd remind you of the whole thing of lies. To, to the degree that you and I listen to lies, we're walking in gloom. And uh, I, I remember one time, uh, I, I don't know why it happened. Oh, I remember why it happened. My mother had a huge, uh, what do you call it, uh, was given one of these very large things with different kinds of spices but different kinds of spice jars. And my sister transferred the spices to the jars without corresponding the name to what was on the spice. So you could well pick up what I uh, said was cinnamon and end up with coriander seed, you know. But I, needless to say, the recipes did not work, okay? <laughs> and this is basically what he's saying. He said, if, if what you're working with is lies, the lies cannot produce what you want. And you have to, have to be very, very careful of that. And in society, it, it's a matter of a kind of commitment in which you and I look for truth, whether it's a, a pleasant truth or an unpleasant truth. I oftentimes think of this like with going to a doctor, you know, the, the, like when I was diagnosed with cancer. I would rather not have gone to the doctor. But I'm healthy today because I listened to the bad news and we did something about it. The, the, you have to, it's truth that matters. It, it wouldn't have done me any good. I just certainly felt better that day if the doctor told me nothing was wrong, go home, everything's fine. But that wouldn't have been good for me. So sometimes there are truths that we need to hear about ourselves or our society. But the key to making things work is to the degree we're working on truth. And I think the once people begin to accept lies, they actually lose the inability to discern truth. It just becomes a morass, and it, it, you, you can't separate it. The, 
again, I, I would say, if you, if you look at the scriptures, you'll find out the key to Jesus' structure is truth. He is the truth. And the key to Satan's structure is a lie. And you watch that right from the beginning of Genesis. Like, um, what do you call it? Uh, in the first pages of Genesis, this is, this is one of the ways a rabbi would analyze it. But at the beginning of Genesis, um, God creates Adam and Eve, he puts them in the garden and forbids them to eat the fruit from a particular tree. And the snake comes up and says, I understand you aren't allowed to eat the fruit of any of these trees, a lie. Eve corrects him and she says, no, we can eat the fruit of all the trees except this one tree where we may not eat the fruit or touch it. Now she has lied because he never said you shouldn't touch it. He said you couldn't eat the fruit. It's just that simple. And they will tell you the sin has to follow. Once you enter into the area of the lie, the sin will follow automatically. And that's what Satan tries to do. He tries constantly to get us to accept the lies. Now understand, you can't accept a lie accidentally. Like if I accept a lie accidentally, that's not gonna be any harm for me. I've just been deceived. It's when I knowingly decide to use this lie as an increment in the way I'm living or something like that. As soon as I knowingly accept the lie, then I've, the whole thing falls apart. So anyway, he says, um, like, like blind, we feel our way along the walls. We grope our way like people without eyes. We stumble as though noon were twilight among the healthy as though we were dead. And I like the idea of comparison to blindness because it means you don't know what, what you're dealing with. If, if it's a lie, you know, that you, you just don't know it. I, I remember when I was in, the, uh, in New York, the first uh, whole winter I spent uh, in uh, a, a place of that kind of weather was in Rhinebeck, New York which was where the novitiate for the Maris were, and you had to stay there for a year. But we had a, they called it a pond, and California would rank as a lake. But anyway, this uh, rather large body of water on the property, probably five times the size of this room, and it was uh, there. And uh, I, you know, the, the winter, you have fall, fall is magnificent in that part of the area. Winter is hell. but. Then, you know, you get into the winter. So one day, one of the guys told us, one of the guys from California uh, told us that the pond was frozen over. And so we all went down there with our skates. And fortunately, we were rescued by a Canadian. But the fact of the matter is, a pond does not freeze overnight. A layer will freeze overnight. But if you think the pond is frozen, you're operating on a lie. And when you step on it, you'll go through it. Anytime you're operating on a lie, it, there's disaster set up, whether you know it's a lie or not. But to knowingly bring it, you lose your ability to discern truth. He says, like bears, all of us growl. Like doves, we can't do anything but moan. We wait for the fair judgment, but it never comes for salvation and it's far from us. Of course, he said at the beginning, they have moved away from fair judgment. Remember the first line, fair judgment is remote from us. We wait for fair judgment and never comes. That's the last line. And that's because they've chosen to live in this way. Like Again, if I'm living a lie about my life, I will never be able to reform the real areas that need to be reformed. And I can never find good judgment in that. He says, for our rebellions against you have been many, and our sins bear witness against us. And, and now this is sort of Israel uh, speaking in, uh, what do you call it, repentance. It says, our rebellions against you have been many, and our sins bear witness against us. The sin, it's from the results of the sins that bear the witness. He says, our rebellions are with us still, and we know our guilt. 
And this idea of the rebellions being with us still is to understand that in honesty we come before God and in honesty we need forgiveness, but in honesty we're never going to become perfect. We are always a people who will need repentance. And so, but that's to recognize it, to recognize that we, we have, to, have to always be conscious of this uh, uh, going on in this way. He says, rebellion and denial of the Lord, turning away from our God, talk of violence and revolt, murmuring, fill our heart. And um, the, in, in psychology, you, you discover that a person lives their life out of what they nourish in their heart. And people who nourish violence in their hearts, it eventually becomes a part of their life. I think it's, it's curious when you watch different ones of these serial killers, the where it began in their background and how young they were and the, the violence that was rather, you know, insignificant at the time. I, I remember listening to a lecture one time and the professor who was giving the lecture said, um, not all children who abuse animals end up serial killers. But every serial killer has been an abuser of animals. That, that, that's just their background. And the, these people tend to be violent and the violence is nurtured, okay? And I think all of us have been in situations or something that would inspire a violent reaction from us to the degree, you know, we can be violent in a certain situation. But the idea is how do I control that? Is, is violence the sort of thing I'm going to give into? If I'm going to give into violence, violence will graduate in my life. It begins, you know, probably with the way we talk to one another or something like that. But violence begins very low and it graduates. And all of life, you know, is a matter of these paths. If I'm walking down the path of grace, it'll be a slow procedure, but it will take me down the path of grace. If I'm walking down the path of violence, it'll be a slow development, but it'll take me to violence. If I'm walking down the path of the lie, it'll be a slow development, but I'll end up believing huge lies. Or if I'm walking down the path of truth, then I'm walking towards the Lord. You know, that these, these things, we understand they all develop, and we look at them initially, they seem unimportant because they begin small, all of them do. He said, um, Fair judgment is driven away. Righteousness keeps its distance. Good faith has stumbled in the street and sincerity cannot enter. Good faith has vanished. Whoever turns from evil pays the price, okay? And this idea of the person who turns from evil paying the price, remember we started out about this, about God telling leaders to make people on this path of holiness? That the thing is, you can reach a point where you're not only, um, <clears throat> what do you call it? You're not only uh, opening this path of evil, but you actually end up punishing people who do anything other than this evil. And again, the idea of punishing people who will not accept the lie that even you know is the lie. You punish them for not accepting it. And the, the, that goes on. Everyone who turns away from evil pays the price. Now it goes on, as I told you, this part of Isaiah is largely a part that deals with salvation. So he says, the Lord saw this, the absence of fair evil, of a fair judgment was evil in his eyes. He saw that there was no one and appalled that there was none to intervene. So he says, God looks at it, he sees this evil, and no one is really intervening to do anything about it. And particularly at fault here are the leaders. So his own arm won him victory. His own saving justice upheld him. And what was his saving arm? His saving arm was bringing Babylon to take the Jews into exile. Because into exile they had to, the Jewish Babylonian exile was probably one of the most important things in all of Judaism because they, they were taken away from their temple and they had no priesthood because priesthood can't operate outside the temple in the Jewish system. 
So they had no priesthood, they had no worship, they had no anything, and they were off on this uh, thing as, uh, uh, what do you call it, prisoners. And yet they knew in order to get back to Israel, they had to become faithful Jews. And what, what were they going to do? How could they do that without the priesthood and all this sort of thing? Well, what they developed is what we call the Pharisees. They developed people who studied the law. And so what the worship had been for the Jews, the law became when they were in Babylon because they could take the law wherever they wanted to go. But the worship had to be in the temple. That's very, very clear. The reason why God did that is when the Jews had more than one temple, they ended up thinking they had more than one God. So there was only one temple. It had to take place there. So they were forced to develop this whole thing with regards to the law. And that's the reason why Judaism has survived historically. That any time they're separated, the Jews, are, they all have the law. They go off, they can be faithful to Judaism with their law. So he said, his own saving justice upheld him. He put on saving justice like a breastplate, the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on vengeance like a tunic and wrapped himself in zeal like a cloak. And the, the image here, I think you'll recognize this comes up in the Christian scriptures too. Paul would talk about this, about the helmet of salvation, all this sort of thing. And, and he looks at these different things as elements in sort of preparing you to be a, uh, a, a soldier. You know, it, it, it's a curious thing. I'm, I'm surprised we don't use it more in our society, but the, there is a process in which a person uh, in getting dressed uh, for one of a peculiar type of thing. I would, I would compare it, let's say, to a woman at the time of her wedding, the, the process that goes through with regard to the dresses and this sort of thing. And, and when she begins the ceremony, she's actually a different person. She has put on this personality and she goes into it like that. You see that with regards to soldiers. You know, when they come by and put on the flashy uniform and all this sort of thing. See it with Boy Scouts. You see it with priests. That's why we use vestments at the altar, that you, you are supposed to be putting on something else. But to, to understand that we need to put on these things, these virtues need to be the things that, that hold us up and, and are really a part of us. And he says, uh, to each one he repays their due. Retribution to enemies, reprisals on his foes. To the coastlands, he repays their due. Remember the coastlands are uh, Greece. And one of the big problems uh, after the Babylonian exile, one of the big problems in Israel was the incursion of the Greek culture. Alexander started that when he went through the area. But then you see the incursion and uh, forget the name of the guy who, who tried to do it there, but he, he um, mandated uh, Greek culture and they had to have Greek temples. Uh, if a child, they found a child who had been circumcised, the child was killed and hung around the mother's neck and she was marched through the town and stoned to death outside. Uh, and they built these big gymnasiums in, uh, uh, what do you call it, in Israel. And the purpose of the gymnasiums was not so much to foster the, uh, the games and stuff, but it was to discover, because their, their competitions were in the nude, it was to discover the men who were circumcised. That was the whole purpose of the thing. And they, they really went out, you were found with a copy of the Bible, or, or the Jewish scriptures, what they would do would burn you at the stake and started the fire with the Bible they caught you with. This is, but it just a really, really horrible thing. And it was, it was such a terrible persecution. And it's recorded in the, uh, um, the books of Maccabees. But it was such a horrible persecution. It lasted for three and a half years. And <clears throat> if you read the book of Revelation, that a lot of those things are called in, like, for instance, they will say that the end times are, are to last for two times a time and a half. 
That's the three and a half years. Or they'll list it so many days. Look at the number of days, it's three and a half years. That they constantly use this, it was such a horrible time, it becomes the model for the very end of the world. He's, but the Greeks were responsible for that. So he says, from the west, they fear the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun, his glory. For he will come like a pent up stream driven by the breath of the Lord. And this pent up stream, remember that Israel is uh, basically a desert country. And one of the things that is really dangerous in, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, desert countries, is flash flooding. When I was uh, in Israel one time, uh, one of the things a lot of people like to visit is the Dead Sea. And so you go down, uh, basically you go down from Jerusalem to Jericho and follow the road along the uh, Jordan River until you get down. But you're going very down. I think you know the, the Dead Sea is the lowest place on the face of the earth. So you're going very, very deep when you go down there. Well, the day before I went there, there were five people killed. And those five people drove down there in a Volkswagen. And while they were in sun, and there was no rain at all, <clears throat> it had rained up in the high desert, and they had a flash flood, and their Volkswagen was washed into the Dead Sea, and they all drowned there. If you go down in that area, like if you ever go in a, a guide or something, one of the things you'll notice is that in the Jewish guides, they will always have the radio on. And the radio will warn them about those things. And also all the, um, all the tour bus drivers are all tank drivers too. So they need to know if they need to be called up immediately. So all that is contained that way. But whoever was down there drove down the Volkswagen they didn't have the, the thing on. So God's, God's uh, vengeance is going to come like this uh, pent-up stream, like this flash flood that moves through. And it'll be driven by the breath of the Lord. He will come to Zion as Redeemer for those in Jacob who turn from rebellion, declares the Lord. So he says he's going to come as a Redeemer, and he comes as a Redeemer for all those who have repented. Okay? And those who are the cause of the problem, he will, he will destroy them. And what happened in the destruction of the, the Greek uh, cultural thing, <clears throat> it was one of the very few rebellions in Israel that actually conquered and drove people out. The Maccabees rebellion actually uh, drove them out. The Jews several times have gotten organized when, after they were out, got organized and come in and retaken the territory. But very seldom, in fact only once, has an actual rebellion risen and done it. That was the rebellion of the Maccabees. And so the Lord speaks. He says, for my part, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, which is on you, and my words, which I have put in your mouth, will not leave your mouth or the mouths of your children or the mouths of your children's children, says the Lord, from now on and forever. So he says, my covenant is that my spirit is to be with you, but that spirit is connected to God's word. So he says, I give my word to you, and that's the scriptures themselves, and they pass down, you have the parent, children, this sort of thing. And, uh, and he says, ultimately, he said that this will always be available to them. And that to anyone who turns to it, God will, God will move in their favor. And, and so that's the promise right from the beginning. As, as I'm reading this, I'm reminded that this week, um, I was given a, uh, a Bible, or, it's, it's a Bible I'm very familiar with. It's a very classic edition of the Bible. It was done in the United States. It's a massive thing. It's got the sacraments, the number of popes. And it's just, you know, a potpourri of Catholic information uh, with the, the Bible text in there. But it was given to me by a family who uh, their, uh, their father died, and their father kept it because it was kind of a family heirloom but they said no one has opened it for over 100 years. 
And so they gave it to me. And that this idea that what he's saying here is this word is where the spirit is given and nourished. And to the, have that word and to allow it to be nourished and built in us is actually what's going to ultimately save us. And so, um, you know, we can start this next one next time. This is 60, chapter 60, verse 1. And it basically was going to speak now about, uh, it takes a whole different turn. And it goes to the idea of the glory that is to come to Jerusalem. Okay? These, uh, these, these uh, rebellion things are just really craziness. We're getting to the end of this book, too. You might begin to think of where you might want to go next. But, first of all, are there any questions? <laughs>